series. Uh, the series is called DNA, The Building Blocks of Life. Now, it's a very short series. It's three weeks long, and each week we are looking at one of the core values that we have established for white fields and uh, who we believe that God has called us to be as a church, what we believe that God has called us to be about. And those three things we're looking at are gospel, mission, and community gospel mission and community we believe that these are the building blocks of life and that means life as in the Christian life and the building blocks of the life of the church this week we'll be looking at mission a mission is important and here's why because the Bible is essentially the story of God's mission and what that means for us is that if we are to be truly gospel centered that means that we must be mission centered we must be mission minded people because Our God is a God on a mission, and he has called us to join him in that mission. The question, though, remains, what exactly is this mission that God is on, and and then what is our part in that mission? So those are the two questions that we're going to be looking at today from the scriptures. Number one, the nature of the mission, and number two, our part in the mission. But before we get into that, what I'd like to do is look at our text this morning, which comes from Isaiah chapter 6. If you have your Bible, please do follow along with me there. We're going to be looking at the first eight verses. Isaiah chapter 6 is one of those places in the Bible, one of those number of events in the Bible where we see that a person has an encounter with God, and as a result, they are changed. They are changed in an instant. Their attitude, their outlook, their future is changed in the presence of God when they encounter him, when they are found in his presence. And that is what happens when you really encounter God. You know that? When you really have a true encounter with the Lord, with the living God, when he breaks into your life, when he shows up and he speaks to your heart, he opens your eyes, he reveals himself to you, your attitude, your outlook, and your future are changed. They're changed. So here's what we read in chapter 6 of Isaiah. It says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah has a vision of the Lord in majesty. And he sees these angels around the the Lord. It says this, above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And says that the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of his name. And the house was filled with smoke. So here in Isaiah 6, what we have is is a picture of what happens to a person, what can happen to you and I, what should happen to you and I when we encounter God, when we have a, a vision, when we truly see, when our eyes are open to truly glimpse the greatness and the glory of God. The first thing that happens when you truly encounter God is this. You cannot help but be filled with a sense of awe and wonder. You can't help but be filled with a sense of awe and wonder at his majesty, at his greatness, at his holiness. Because he is the one who is the embodiment of everything that's right and true. He's the one who spoke the universe into being with his voice. He's the one who holds all things together. And look at what happens next. Isaiah, he gets this glimpse of God's greatness and holiness. And look at his response in verse 5. He says, I said, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The next thing that happens when you truly encounter God When you're filled with a sense of awe and wonder because of the glory of his majesty and the glory of his holiness, the next thing that happens is that as a result of seeing that, you cannot help but be filled with a sense of your own inadequacy. You know that? That's what happened to him. He saw the glory of the Lord. He was filled with awe and wonder. And as a result, he had a sense of his own inadequacy. Isaiah says, woe is me. He says, I am lost. I'm messed up. I'm unclean. Woe is me. 
Now the reason why this is so interesting is because if you would look back at the previous chapters of Isaiah that precede chapter 6, what you're going to notice is that you see Isaiah and he's going around and he's pronouncing judgment on other people, right? He's going around pronouncing judgment on all the people. The first five chapters of this book, Isaiah's walking around and he's telling everybody, woe is you, woe is you. He's pronouncing judgment on them because they've turned away from God and maybe rightly so but he's saying woe is you but here in chapter 6 guess what happens Isaiah gets a glimpse of God he's filled with awe and wonder he's faced as a result with a sense of his own inadequacy and no longer is he saying woe is you but guess what he's saying woe is me and that's a really important step for every person to take when you get your eyes off of other people's shortcomings and sins and you stand before the Lord and you say Lord you are holy and I have fallen short. I am lost. I am unclean. I don't know about my neighbor, but all I know is that I am messed up and I'm a sinner. And Lord, I need you to cleanse me and to heal me and to save me. Because you know what? I know you know this, but it is not very difficult to find something wrong with somebody else. Do you know that? You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be Albert Einstein to figure out somebody else's problems, right? That, that's one of the easiest things in the world. You know, that's low-hanging fruit. Anybody can do that, right? Criticizing others, picking up on their inadequacies, their sins, man, that's easy. It doesn't take a great man or a great woman to do that. But you know what? When you really encounter God, it changes your outlook. And here's one of the ways it does that. It causes you to do something which is very healthy. And that is this. It causes you to take your eyes off of other people and their shortcomings. And it causes you to see yourself clearly for who you are in relation to God. And it forces you to go from being self-righteous to being faced with the fact of your own inadequacy. So what does he say when he sees the glory of God? When he's filled with a sense of awe and wonder, he says, Woe is me. I am lost. I am unclean. I am messed up. I need you, Lord. And that's an important step. But I, what, what, what I want you to see is that God doesn't leave you there. Look what happens next. In verse 6, we read this. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. When you truly encounter God, when you're filled with a sense of awe and wonder at his majesty and at his holiness, then you're faced with the sense of your own inadequacy and you cry out to him and to help you and save you and cleanse you. And you know what happens? God comes and he meets you at that moment. He meets you with grace and he gives you grace. He says your sin is atoned for and he cleanses you. And you come to know the grace of God. And you know what happens when you come to know the grace of God? You're filled with a sense of comfort. Greatest comfort in the world, knowing that you have been cleansed. That your guilt has been taken away and your sin atoned for. But here's the thing. Many people think it ends there. And that's what we're talking about today. That it doesn't end there. There's more to this story than that. It wasn't just that he was faced with a sense of awe and wonder in the presence of God. It wasn't just that he was faced with a sense of his own inadequacy. It wasn't even just that he received the grace of God and received comfort in knowing that his sin had been taken care of. But there's one more indispensable part of this story. One more in indispensable thing that God wants to do. Verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. When Isaiah got a glimpse of God's majesty and holiness, he went from saying, Woe is you, to saying, Woe is me. And when Isaiah experienced the grace of God, guess what? He went from saying, Woe is me, to saying, Here I am, send me. For you too, when you truly encounter God, when you come to know his grace, you will be filled with a sense of awe and wonder. You will be filled with a sense of your own inadequacy. But when you receive his grace, you will be filled with the desire to respond by answering him. And here's the way that he is calling us to answer him. This is so important. This is what it's all about today. The way that we respond to him is by answering his call to join him in his mission. That's what Isaiah did as well. 
Because really the Bible is the story of God's mission. It tells us that the God that we worship, the God of the universe, the God of the Bible, he is a God who is on a mission and therefore to follow him means to join him in his mission. See, the word mission fundamentally describes who God is and what he's all about. And so the, the nature of mission, what is the nature of this mission that we have been called to join God in, that God is on? God's mission, here's the nature of it. It is a mission of salvation and redemption. The Bible begins by telling us how God created the world. And it says there that it was very good. But then how did the world get to be the way it is today, right? Well, obviously, the Bible tells that story. The, the problem is sin. The reason is sin. Rebellion, sin, it came into the world. It caused corruption. It caused death and decay. It caused breakdown in every area of life that God created. Sin separated sinful man from the holy God. It caused us to be lost. It forced us to be sick. It caused us to be cursed and condemned. And so the mission of God as Jesus himself stated it, is this, to seek and to save the lost. It is to redeem that which has been lost and corrupted by sin. In the book of Revelation, at the end of all things, at the end of that mission where it tells us how it will all be wrapped up, he says this, behold, I make all things new. That's the mission. It's a mission of salvation and redemption and restoration. So that's the nature of the mission. And, and this is the story of the Bible, really, how God is actively working in human history to save and redeem from the curse of sin. It has been well said that mission exists because worship does not. Mission exists because worship does not, because there are people in this world who are estranged from God. There are people in this world who do not know God, they do not love God, they do not worship God. And for that reason, because those people are lost in their sin, God is on a mission. Mission exists because worship does not yet. Historically, the, the Latin term which has been used for this is the term missio dei. Now that's actually a, a very interesting term, right? Missio dei, which means the mission of God. But here's the thing, it's such an interesting term because it has a dual meaning. Missio dei is this fancy Latin term, but the reason that term has stuck around so long is because it means two things. Because in Latin, the word missio literally means sent or to send, right? So missio dei, it, it means two things. It's profound because it reflects that both that God is on a mission, that God has a mission that he's calling us to, and that God is sending people into his mission. Mission is central to what God is is all about and who God is. If you look at the Trinity, here's what you will see. Sent and sending, right? What you see is that the Father has this mission and he sends the Son into the world on this mission as a missionary to come to this world. And then together, the Father and the Son, they send the Spirit, right? And then Jesus says to all Christians, he says, as the Father sent me, now I send you. Now I send you. And he gives them the Holy Spirit to empower them to do that. So sentness, I realize that's a made up word, but sentness, if it were a word, it would be an adjective which qualifies and defines who we are as a church. We are a people who have been sent into the world. Not only have we been reconciled to God, but we have been recruited we have been called, we have been sent, and we have been empowered to carry out and carry on this mission of God. And the point is this, and this is what we learned from Isaiah's story as well. God not only wants to save you, but he wants to send you. Another way to put it is this. God never calls us in to bless us without also sending us out to be a blessing. God never calls you in to bless you without also sending you out to be a blessing. Consider Jesus' disciples with me. Jesus, he, he went out and he handpicked 12 men to be his disciples. And his call to them, do you remember what it was? Almost to each and every one of them. Come and follow me. And you remember what he said to the fishermen? Come and follow me. Why? 
because I will make you a fisher of men. You see, the mission was already at the heart of the call to follow him. And, and that was the call, follow Jesus. So what do they do? They follow Jesus around, sometimes at great cost to themselves. They follow Jesus around. He teaches them. He mentors them is, the, is mostly the, the modern word that we would use for what he did. They were with him all the time. They ate together. They traveled together. They were with him. They watched Jesus perform miracles. They sat there as he taught large groups of people. And very often, he would pull them aside and he would minister just to them individually. But then what did he do? That wasn't all that he did. What did he do after that? After a while of having these disciples sit at his feet, Jesus start sending them out to do ministry. After having them watch him do it, right, and, and learning from him, he starts letting them do ministry too, and he starts sending them out on these little weekend mission trips, right? And then when they came back, they would report to him of how it went, right? But what was the point of all of this? What, what is the point of this? What is Jesus' goal with picking out these guys and training them up? Why is he spending all this time with them? And here's the point. The point is that Jesus knew that the day was coming when he would ascend the hill of Calvary and give his life as a ransom for our sins. And he was preparing these people to carry on the mission of God. That was the whole point of this discipleship program, of this mentoring relationship, to train these people up to carry on and carry out the mission of God in their generation. You see, Jesus' plan with the disciples, it was to minister to them and teach them so they would know God, so they would have eternal life, but beyond that, it was, it was even beyond that too. It was his purpose with teaching them and training them was so that they could join in that mission, that great mission of God which the Father has been doing ever since the moment sin came into the world, which he will be doing until all things are made new. This mission of God for which the Father had sent the Son into the world, he was training up others so that he could send them out as well. Every single person who followed Jesus, do you realize this? Every single person, we think of the people who followed Jesus, right? There was, there was Martha who loved to serve him. We always downplay her. We don't need to downplay her. She didn't choose the greater thing, but she did choose a great thing. She was serving him. But, but you know what? There's Mary who just wanted to sit at his feet. But both Martha and Mary, and even his very own mother, Mary, after he died and he was risen, he gathered these people, and you know what he did? He commissioned all of them. Every single one of them, each of them, he commissioned them to go out into the world and carry out the mission for which he had come. And here's the point. This is what I want you to take away. To be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, inherently means to be one who is sent. Sent into the world on God's mission. You see this idea of the mission of God, right? That God is on a mission, that God is sending us into his mission. If you get it, if you let it sink in, it will change the way that you look at the church. It will change the way that you look at the, the, your relationship with God even as to what the purpose and identity of the church is because oftentimes and you, you all know this oftentimes mission is thought of as something that the church does amongst many other things right it's one of the things that the church does along with bingo nights and potluck dinners and youth lock-ins and pancake breakfasts along with all those other things we also do missions right but understanding this concept of the mission of God, it recalibrates your mind. It recalibrates your thinking because what you realize is that there is no such thing as missions with an S, as in a plural mission. That mission isn't just an activity that the church does, but there is one mission. And it's all about that. That's the main thing. That is God's main thing. There is one mission. No S, right? Not a plural. It is the mission of God to seek and to save the lost. And you know what? If there's one mission, that means there's only one mission field. And that is the whole earth. Every square foot of God's green earth. That's what Jesus said, actually. He said, God so loved the world, the whole world, every inch of it that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but would have 
everlasting life. I spent 10 years in Hungary as a missionary. A lot of you know that about me. Um, we were doing church planting. We were also doing humanitarian work. Spent a lot of time working with refugees and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, impoverished people as well. But even during the time that I spent in Hungary, I was very wary of the term missionary um, because there's a lot of baggage that comes along with that word. But it was what was written on my 1099 statement and it was uh, on my tax return. So I guess I embraced the identity of missionary. But here's my problem with this term missionary. I lived in Hungary and I did what I believe to be what every Christian is called to do. And that is this. I lived out my faith. I shared my faith with others. I served in a local church and I served my community in the name of Jesus. Does that make me a missionary or does that make me a Christian? This is my dilemma, right? And not only that, and here's the thing that really got to me, not only that, but I did it alongside a bunch of Hungarians, right? Who were doing the exact same things that I was doing, only they didn't get the title of missionary. They were just doing it because they read the Bible and, and that's what Christians are called to do, right? Because having been saved by Jesus, we've also been sent by Jesus into the world on the mission of God. So I started to wonder, at what point are you a missionary and at what point are you just being a Christian, right? Because it seems to me that as a missionary, I wasn't doing anything except living out what I see in the Bible as the normal Christian life. It seems to me that every Christian has been commissioned by Jesus to go into all the world and make disciples and love people and share the, share the love of God with people and serve people in his name. That's not just for some people. That's not just for professional missionaries. That is for all of us. That is what it means to be a Christian, right? Some people might say, okay, well, maybe you become a missionary, when you are doing ministry in a foreign country, cross-culturally. But then that raises a whole other question. At what point do we define where the mission field begins and ends, right? At what point do you enter the mission field? And at what point do you leave the mission field? We can't define it geographically. We certainly can't define it economically. Because some of the poorest countries in the world today, places like Latin America, Africa, some places in Asia, are places with the highest concentration of born-again Christians, right? Where there's a vibrant Christian community. Whereas some of the most unreached people groups now live in some of the most wealthy developed countries in the world. You see what I'm saying? We can't define it geographically. We can't define it economically. I read a study recently which surprised me. It said that one of the people groups which is most unreached with the Christian gospel, guess who it is? Muslims living in the United States. Isn't that shocking? You know, or consider the wealthy countries of Western Europe, which has long been referred to as a post-Christian society. But here's the deal. Most people still would think of Africa or, or Latin America as the mission field, but not Scandinavia, only because Scandinavia is developed and wealthy. But if you listen to Jesus talk, here's what you realize. That God's mission is for all people everywhere in the world. And that would mean that every square foot of God's green earth is a mission field, right? God doesn't see borders. God doesn't see the divisions that we see. He sees individuals. Maybe you'd say, well, you're a missionary when you live off of donations so that you can do ministry. Well... Well, what about Paul? He was a missionary, certainly, but there were times when he worked a job to pay his bills. There are plenty of people who do the work of God in their vocation in amazing and effective ways. And at the same time, I have seen people who live off of donations and they are not really serving the Lord in the same capacity. So if that's all it takes to be a missionary is to live off of donations, well, certainly that's too weak of a definition of what a missionary is. If the word mission means to send or sent, 
then a missionary is one who is sent, one who has been commissioned and sent out on a mission. But here's the thing. Every single one of us, this is my point. We read Jesus' words. Every single one of us has been commissioned. We've all been sent out by Jesus into his mission, the mission of God to bring salvation and redemption of the gospel to all the world. So I guess that means that we're all missionaries. I believe that's true. And that's why I'm apprehensive about the word missionary, that we would use it for some Christians but not for others, in a a sense saying that we have a different expectation of some people than for other people. It insinuates that there's a difference between what a missionary does and between what the rest of people who are Christians are called to do and be a part of. I don't believe that's true. So getting back to the purpose and identity of the church. The church was formed. We look at the book of Acts. The church was formed and it was commissioned by Jesus. Why? To be part of his commission. To be part of this mission. Sending people into all the world to carry out his mission. In other words, in the book of Acts, the church was formed at its inception as a missional community. That was the whole point. A community of people on mission with God. In other words, it wasn't that God created the church and then gave them a mission to do. No, it was that God created the church for the purpose of carrying out his mission. You could put it this way, that it isn't that the church has a mission, it's that the mission has a church. Emil Brunner put it this way, he said, the church exists by mission as a fire exists by burning. Maybe you would say, okay, well, so what does that mean for me as a Christian? What does that mean for us as a church practically? And that gets us to our second point here. What is our part in his mission? What does it look like for you and I to live out the mission of God? What does it look like for our church to be a missional community like the one that we see in the book of Acts? I'll give you a few ideas here. First of all, to be missionally minded means to be intentional. Okay, to be missionary minded means to be intentional in your actions. It means to be constantly aware that you are on a mission, right? For us as a church, one thing that means practically is that everything we do, and I mean everything, we do it intentionally for two purposes. Two purposes. Number one, to build up believers in their most holy faith. To build up those who are already locked in in believers. To build them up, to encourage them, to train them, to teach them. So they can know the love of God. So they can know it better. So they can intrinsically live out the gospel. But number two, intentionally we do everything we do with a view of people who are not yet believers, reaching out to them, speaking to them in a way that's understandable, comprehensible, that's compelling to them, so that they too can be challenged by the gospel, so they can come to know the love of God and the salvation of Jesus Christ. Everything we do, I'm serious, from our Sunday services, to the music that we worship with, to our picnics in the park, to our home fellowships, even to our marriage event coming up this Friday. We talked about last week how our goal in everything we do is to be gospel-centered but here's what I want you to see this week to be gospel-centered intrinsically means to be missional minded to be missional minded to have that missionary mindset in everything we do being missionally minded also means that as a church that we see one of our main goals with believers to equip them so they can be sent out into their workplaces their communities their schools wherever God has placed you so that you can effectively serve God in the way that he's called you to play a part in his mission. Another way that what missionally minded means, it means this, it means to be outward focused. Be outward focused, that's what it means to be mission minded. When when I preach or when I talk about God, I always try to use words that would be understandable to any person, whether they're a Christian, whether they've been a Christian for 20 years, or whether they have no prior understanding of what Christianity is all about. I try to avoid using jargon. Why? That's what it means to be outward focused, right? In the epistle of Jude, Jude writes, have mercy on those who doubt. You remember that video I showed you at the beginning? Uh, Timothy Keller there, he's saying that the missional church understands what it's like to not believe. 
We understand the problems that people have with the church, the hypocrisy and all these things. We understand and we speak to them on that level. This is an interesting verse. I read this in my, my own private study this week. It said, have mercy on those who doubt. That really struck me. Well, what it means is people who doubt, people who don't believe the way that you do, uh, they aren't your enemy. Don't treat them as your enemy, right? They're not your enemy. We have an enemy, and it's not them, right? Our enemy is not people who don't believe the same things that we do. Rather, what do we do with those people? We are patient with them. We love them. We show them mercy, and we build relationships with them intentionally without compromising who we are called to be as Christians so that through those relationships we might represent to them the love of God as ambassadors of Christ and hopefully through those relationships have the opportunity to help them come to move past their doubt to move past their unbelief into a saving faith in Jesus Christ Another thing that it means to be missional is it means to be incarnational. To be missional means to be incarnational. Now that's a big fancy word, but here's all it means. To be incarnational means to meet people where they're at. You meet people where they're at because think about this. This is what God did for us in Jesus Christ. He met us where we were at, right? The incarnation is that God became a man. He came to live among us. He took on our flesh. He spoke our language. He lived our life so that we could understand this message of the gospel. One, uh, I once heard it described this way. Imagine this. You're out. You're walking on a trail one day. You're, you're hiking. And, and as you're going along, you start to smell something off in the distance. The wind's just kind of carrying it your way. And it's far away, but it just smells terrible, right? As you get closer, you realize that you're getting closer to this stench, and it just gets so strong, it's going to knock you over. So, you know, you start to cover your nose with your shirt. Uh, it's just this horrible, rotten smell. And at one point, you come around a corner, and you, you find the source of this stench. There, there's a dead animal lying across the path, right in the middle of the trail, and you're grossed out. It's disgusting. And, and you're like, I got to get out of here. So, so you take a big, you know, detour around this carcass. And as you're going around it, you're, you're feeling relieved at the prospect of getting away from this smell. When you notice out of the corner of your eye, all these little white things moving around on there. They're maggots, right? Hundreds of them, maybe thousands. They're, they're there and they're just moving around. And, and although the smell is terrible, suddenly... You don't care about the smell anymore, and here's why. Because your heart is just going out to those maggots, right? You're like, these poor little guys, right? They're just wasting their life. They're just living in this filthy carcass. It stinks here. They don't even know that there's more than this. They don't even know that they don't have to live this way, right? And you just, your heart goes out to them. You're just filled with compassion and love for them, and you, you just want to help them. Right? And your heart is overwhelmed with love for them. And you don't care about the smell anymore. All you can see uh, is how you want to save them from that stinking carcass where they're wasting their lives. And you just want to take them home with you and put them in a little aquarium, you know, and make a wonderful place for them to live. And so you start yelling at them. You say, hey maggots! Hey guys! It's me, Nick! I love you! I'm here for you! I want to take you home to be with me! I, there's something much better than this. I want to show it to you. I want to save you from this pointless existence in this stinky carcass. Just come with me. I, I will take you home. I will give you a new future. It's going to be wonderful. But the maggots just don't respond to you at all. They just keep doing their thing like you're not even there, right? No matter how much you say, no matter how loud you yell. And so you get out a piece of paper from your backpack, right? And you draw them a picture of your house and, and happy faces and stuff. And you're like, look, guys, this is it. Don't you understand? I love you. I want to save you from this. I want to bring you to live with me. Come on. Come with me. But again, there's just no response whatsoever from these maggots. It's like they don't even know you're there. And then you realize you have this light come on in your mind. You realize the only way to reach those maggots is for you to become a maggot, right? That's the only way that you can communicate to them 
in a way that they will understand, in a way that they will get it. If you become a maggot, if you become one of them, then you can speak to them and save them from this rotten carcass and bring them to a new and wonderful home, which is beyond anything that they've ever been able to even grasp or imagine. That is essentially what Jesus Christ has done for us. Being God, he left the glory of heaven because of his great love for us and he became one of us and he entered into our world that he might save us, that he might meet us where we were at and he spoke to us in our language so that he might get our attention and explain to us God's plan of salvation. That is what it means on a much smaller scale for you and I to be missional people. It's to be incarnational like God was incarnational. To go in and live where people live. To enter into their world. To speak their language. Meet them where they're at. That they might hear and understand and comprehend this great call of the gospel. This message of salvation. That's exactly what Paul was talking about when he said, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some right? He says, with Jewish people, I relate to him as a Jew. With Greek people, I relate to him as a Greek. I will become all things to all people without compromising who I am just to meet people where they're at. He entered into their world. He brought them the good news about salvation in Jesus Christ in a way that made sense to them, in a way that was compelling for them where they were at. There's a lot of big words for that. Contextualization, incarnation but here's the point meeting people where they're at I want to tell you about a man who's been a great example and inspiration to me in this area of missional living uh, his name is Chuck Smith and he was probably the unhippest person who ever lived I have to tell you that he was a bald overweight older man but he influenced a generation of people like few people ever have uh, Pastor Chuck Smith passed away this week, and he went home to be with the Lord. And I only met him once. Uh, I was, you know, I've been around him a number of times, but I only talked to him once. But, you know, he had a great impact on my life. And, and he is a great example of what it means to live on mission with God and do church with a missional mindset. In the 1960s, I mean, there's so many stories, but I'm just going to tell you one or two. In the 1960s, Chuck was the pastor of a small church, smaller than ours, in Costa Mesa, California, near the beach, right? And there were a lot of hippies around at that time, and in general, churches and Christians didn't want anything to do with them. They didn't like them. They viewed them as licentious, as filthy, which they were, all of those things. It, it, at a time when people were clean-cut, the hippies were not, right? Chuck Smith, he's probably the, the least, like, you couldn't be not a hippie more than Chuck Smith was not a hippie, right? Again, I'm telling you, a balding, overweight, middle-aged man. Even, when he, even in the 60s, he was already a bald, middle-aged, overweight man, right? And he wore suits all the time. Like, every day he wore suits, like even at home, you know what I mean? And, uh, and he pastored a small church of stuffy, upper-middle-class white people who lived in the suburbs. But this man, his heart went out to these hippies. All these young people who were caught up in this movement of doing drugs and, and sleeping around and living on the beach and in living in cars and vans and, and all these things. And so Chuck and his wife, they started going down to the beach to pray for these kids. And they were hoping to meet some of them. They had never actually met a hippie. They had a daughter who was in high school, and they said, hey, we really want to meet a hippie. Could you introduce us? So one day, the, the daughter picked up a hippie on the side of the road and brought him to meet Chuck. Well, well in time, some, they, they did end up meeting some hippies, and, and, and they started sharing with these hippies about the love of Jesus. And, and some of these hippies got saved, and, and some even started coming to their little church there in Costa Mesa by the beach. Well, at that time, uh, there had been an oil spill off the coast of California, and the, as the oil was washing up on the beach, right, it would leave these little deposits in the sand. And if you stepped on them, right, they would leave your feet or your shoes uh, all covered in this oily, sticky mess, and you would track it around with you. And uh, 
Well, because all these hippies, they're living on the beach, they're all dirty, and they're covered in this oily slime stuff, they start coming to church, right? And they're tracking in all this dirt, right? All this oil, and they had just put a new carpet in that church, and, and they had pews there, right? And so one Sunday, Chuck arrives at church, and there's a sign on the door, on the outer door, that says, shoes and proper attire required to enter the church. Now, you know that these hippies, that kind of meant you're not welcome here, right? Well, Chuck, he took down that sign and he went and talked to his leaders of his church and he said, you know what? We are going to tear out this carpet and throw it in the trash and we're going to get rid of all the pews before we ever hinder a single one of these young people from coming to Jesus. You know, Chuck was not hip. He was like the least hip person. I'm not even kidding. And you know what? He never even tried to be hip, right? He just talked about Jesus and he loved people and he cared for them like Jesus did, no matter how they looked, no matter how they talked, and no matter how they smelled. He started a movement which was gospel-centered. It was outward-focused. It was incarnational. Chuck Smith was a missionary in the truest sense of the word. And over the years, thousands upon thousands of young people got saved through that little church in Costa Mesa. And Chuck invited these people to come in and start playing their music, right? To worship God with the instruments that they like to use, with guitars and drums, which at the time in the 1960s was completely unheard of. Now we take it as normative. At that time, it was unheard of. And so this middle-aged, overweight, balding man, he would then get up there after these hippies would worship Jesus with their songs and he would just teach them the Bible in simple everyday language that anybody could understand. There wasn't a lot of hype, you know that? There wasn't gimmicks, there wasn't smoke machines, there wasn't a laser show, right? There was just this old man standing there in a suit teaching them about Jesus verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and these people were changed. And you know what his goal was? He always said it. His goal was that after you become a Christian, he wants you to learn God's word so much that you will be equipped to go out and serve God and play your part in God's mission. And from all those hippie kids, hundreds of them were trained up by Pastor Chuck to be pastors themselves. And through those men, even more people were raised up to the point where today there are thousands of churches which have been birthed out of that stuffy, little, upper-middle-class white church in Costa Mesa. They changed the way that people did church. They changed the way that we do church today because they were on a mission. They understood what it means to be a people and a church on mission with God. You know, being on mission with God, it it means seeing people the way that God sees them. It means loving people the way that God loves them and telling them the truth about sin and death and salvation in Jesus Christ. And Chuck Smith embodied living on a mission with God and raising up every...